Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as Jane Tabor says with a prayer.
we gather in God's house, and we know we have not always followed God's path. We have sometimes strayed from the way that God wants us to travel. And so now we come before God with the truth of our lives. It is an act of faith. We know that our God is interested in our hearts and our minds and our souls. And we know God's mercy and grace are intended for each one of us. Together, let us make our confession to God in our prayer of confession at Trinity in the Lord. Holy God, hear our prayer. Sometimes our lives are a mess because of choices we have made or because of choices others have made. Sometimes our lives are great and we're kind and generous. Sometimes our lives are great and we forget to be grateful and humble. We trust that in the jumble of all this, you are present. We trust that you are with us, walking deep astray, nudging us back to the right path, slowing us down when we get ahead of you, and waiting for us when we let go. So we thank you and ask for your forgiveness and pray that you will stay with us throughout the journey. Almighty God, hear us now as we each silently offer our own prayers of confession. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We have a new beginning, and this is good news. Believe it, receive it, proclaim it. Amen and amen. Let us stand together for the glory of God. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Make your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not threaten when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Thank you, Joseph. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. But to give you a little heads up about what has been happening in John's Gospel up to this point, uh, Jesus has been proclaimed the Messiah by John the Baptist at his baptism, called his first disciples, he's turned the water into wine at the wedding in Cana, 
He spent some time at Capernaum, and then he headed to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, the pilgrimage that every Jew was called to do. And Jesus has made a very big impression when he came into town because he went to the temple and he chased out the money changers and upset all their tables and drove out all the livestock out of the building. So Jesus was getting noticed. Jesus was getting noticed by the crowds and many were believing him in him and following him. But he was also getting noticed by the religious leaders, prompting many conversations about what to do about this rabbi. So we begin chapter three, Jesus and Nicodemus, a familiar story. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus and, at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do, you, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life with him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, follow me. Jesus said to fishermen and tax collectors, and each one began a pilgrimage with Jesus. He was their mentor, their teacher, their friend, who was preparing them to carry on his ministry. Now a pilgrimage may be a literal trek to a holy place, or it may take on a metaphorical aspect to describe one's journey with God. Every pilgrimage takes time and intention whether it is a physical journey or a relationship which must be nurtured over time to become rich with trust and knowledge. Jesus invited Nicodemus into a new relationship. Jesus asked each one of us to join him on a journey, a pilgrimage, to a deeper relationship with him. In the city for Passover, Jesus' first stop was the temple. John's account of Jesus overturning the money changers' temple, tables and driving all the animals out of the courtyard garnered a lot of, Jesus' actions garnered a lot of attention. Yet this wasn't the only news about Jesus. There were stories of signs 
And Jesus' popularity didn't go unnoticed by the religious leaders, especially after that temple incident. As Jesus' followers grew, so did the frustration of the religious leaders. And Nicodemus was a religious insider. He was a respected teacher. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. I can imagine that he watched the crowds as they listened to Jesus, who spoke in simple but powerful messages. Jesus, Nicodemus, may never have held the attention of an audience like Jesus or performed a miracle, but Nicodemus was intrigued by this rabbi. Nicodemus had questions for Jesus, who was stirring up people and gathering followers. And why did Nicodemus want to meet Jesus? Did he want to meet Jesus to gain pointers for preaching and teaching? Was he envious of the crowds that were following him and the signs that Jesus was able to do? Was Nicodemus going to meet with Jesus to give him a piece of his mind about disrespecting the temple, upsetting the normal operations? Jesus' actions at the temple would have been cause for question, perhaps even dismissing him as crazy. Would you want to go into a face-to-face -face encounter with somebody who disrupted your workplace? Yet by cover of night, Nicodemus went to see Jesus. Perhaps he thought it would be easier to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation at night when there would be fewer interruptions. Perhaps he chose to go at night because he hoped to avoid any awkward questions from the other religious leaders, from his family who were afraid about this discipline. While this was centuries before Twitter and Facebook, even in the first century, there was plenty of opportunity for tongues to wag. Nicodemus greeted Jesus with a compliment. He called him rabbi, which means teacher, even though Jesus was untrained by rabbinical standards. And perhaps Nicodemus expected a reciprocal greeting, but there was none. There was no getting to know you chit chat. Nicodemus referred to the signs Jesus had been doing, signs that proved God was with him. Nicodemus had seen enough in Jesus to believe that he was from God. But he had a lot that he needed to reconcile. He needed to understand more. He came with questions and humility and openness to learn more. When Jesus said to him, I assure you that unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus is confused. He takes Jesus' words literally. He questions this physical rebirth. And in fact, Jesus' words have caused him to question all that he has held so close to his life. You see, Nicodemus believed that his status as a Jew meant that he was born directly into the kingdom of God. It made no sense to him that there was any other way to heaven. Nicodemus ponders, how can an old man be born again? Nicodemus is thinking on concrete terms. But Jesus, as he often does, is speaking in metaphors, a different language, really. He speaks not of the work done of men and women, but the work done by God. Nicodemus had come in the dark, and he's still in the dark. He doesn't understand. He and Jesus are talking past one another. One theologian said that two men stand, were standing at the continental divide of scripture. Nicodemus on one side, Christ on the other, the old and the new. Nicodemus inhabits a land of good efforts, sincere gestures, hard work, close adherence to the scripture and the law. His philosophy was, give God your best, and God does the rest. Jesus' response was, your best works won't do it. Your works and your best efforts mean nothing unless you're born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus that to be born again is to be born above, from above in the Spirit, and to be born of the Spirit is to believe in Jesus, and in believing in him, will have eternal life. D.L. Moody was a Christian evangelist in the 19th, 19th century. He had a very effective ministry in Britain and the United States. Once after addressing a group of church workers, Moody was confront, confronted by an angry woman who said, Mr. Moody, do you mean to tell me that I, an educated woman, 
taught from my childhood in good ways and all my life interested in the church and doing well, must enter heaven the same way as the worst criminal of our day? No, ma'am, said Moody. I don't. God does. God says that everyone who would enter heaven, no matter how good they think they are, or how well educated, or how zealous in good works, must be born again. Have you ever encountered someone or something that made you question everything you thought you knew? Everything you built your life around, your faith, your vocation, your self-understanding? That's probably how Nicodemus felt. He probably felt very much like this woman. What do you mean? I've spent my life training and leading, seeing to the needs of people. I've been a faithful Jew, yet you say it's not enough? You have to be born again? Jesus gently rebuked Nicodemus. Even this prominent teacher of the old law, because he found the Lord's word so new and difficult. So Jesus turned to the Old Testament to clarify. He recalled to Nicodemus how Moses had lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert, so that all who looked upon it by faith would be saved, would be healed. And in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus said the Son of Man would be lifted up and everyone who believes in him would have eternal life. For we know the world was saved by Christ's selfless giving on the cross. And Jesus Christ has promised that whatever may come, we all have God's promise of redemption in and through our belief in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Jew or Gentile, anyone who wants to be saved, need only to look to and believe in Jesus Christ. God's love for the world was demonstrated through Jesus, whom the Pharisees rejected, whose testimony, along with John the Baptist, they did not believe. The Jews wrongly assumed that God loved them because they were Jewish. However, God loved them through Christ, and if they reject Christ, they also reject the love which God manifested towards them in Christ. And then Jesus gave Nicodemus the great truth about God's plan for salvation in simple terms. One of the most well-known and beloved Bible verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. A verse short enough to memorize, write on a business card or a napkin, solid enough to weather 2,000 years of storms and questions, Theologian Max Licato called John 3.16 the hope diamond of the Bible. 26 words of hope, beginning with God and ending with life containing God's promise for all of humanity. I doubt when Nicodemus went to see Jesus that night, he thought his world would be turned upside down by this conversation, or that there would be any need for him to change his thinking, much less his life. However, I think Nicodemus entered into a kind of a pilgrimage that night. He may, not, he may have always assumed his role as an insider and guardian of Jewish tradition would keep him safe, would get him into heaven. And yet he stepped out of his comfort zone to meet Jesus. He had, he had questions. He wanted to know more. He humbled himself in that respect. And God was busy breaking down walls that night, breaking down boundaries. As Nicodemus spoke with this uncredentialed, this new on the scene preacher, he was on the wrong side of most of the religious leaders of his day. Nicodemus was challenged by Jesus in his understanding of faith, challenged to think that neither his birth as a Jew or his education as a Pharisee would grant him access to the kingdom of God. He was a professional. But Jesus said it wasn't about who your ancestors were or what your education was. Knowledge was not salvation. If religion becomes a matter of growth observances and practices, rather than a belief in and a relationship with Jesus Christ, we need rebirth. And that rebirth is available to all by the power of the Spirit. And even, as Jesus points out to Nicodemus, to those religious leaders that think they don't need it. We can easily fall into the same trap as Nicodemus, thinking that if we use the right language, that we are faithful in attending church, 
We're students of the scriptures, but knowledge is not salvation. Relationship with Jesus Christ is our salvation. The evangelist Billy Sunday once said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. It's about relationship. Believing is more than just intellectual agreement. It's putting our trust and faith in Jesus. It's claiming the promise that by believing in him, we can have everlasting life. Faith is like a coin minted on both sides. Beliefs about God on one side, trust in God on the other. Both sides of the coin are necessary. The trust side of faith implies risk, and it's into risk that faith takes its first steps. Faith isn't a once and done action of any of us, but it's an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. As Jesus said, blows where it chooses. Perhaps Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus was the breath of the Spirit moving in his life, beginning the process of rebirth. We know a little of what happened with Nicodemus after this nocturnal encounter. We do know that he did speak to the Jewish High Council on behalf of Jesus when they were discussing his arrest. Nicodemus came out of the dark and into full view at that time. Was that an emboldenment by the Spirit? that led him to be able to speak on Jesus' behalf, or that brought him along with Joseph of Arimathea to ask for Jesus' body after the crucifixion. We can't really know. In matters pertaining, pertaining to God, we can't ever know everything, or even close to everything. Not only can we never fully comprehend God, but the irony is, if not, most of what we might learn about God comes from being in the very act of worshiping and following God. And yet the good news is that God is prepared, even eager, to work with us to do the hard labor that will bring us maturity and new life. God's initial provision for humanity's new life came in the form of Jesus Christ. Each of us is on a faith journey. Some may ju be just beginning, others may be further along, but sometimes we get off the track. Sometimes we're on the way. <coughs> others may be nearing the end of our journey. Yet who among us, no matter what place we are on our journey, doesn't have room to grow and strengthen our faith? God looks for steady growth, not instant perfection. Sometimes that might include questioning what we thought we knew and understand, like Nicodemus did. Questions and doubts can be part of the Holy Spirit working in our life to redirect us, to open us to new things. We are thankful that as a Christian you don't have to leave your brain at the door, that you are able to ask your questions, voice your doubts. These are all parts of deepening our faith. What could happen if we take on the posture of Nicodemus to humble ourselves as learners, to open ourselves to asking questions, to deepening our understanding? Like Nicodemus, we might feel much more comfortable keeping a low profile, staying in the shadows, so to speak. Yet how are we to share God's love with the community if we remain in the shadows? We need to take the risk and step out and profess our faith. Step out into the light, sharing our belief and trust in Jesus Christ. God might be working even now in our lives to bring about new birth, to set us off in a new direction. May we be attentive, listening for the leading of the Spirit, showing a willingness for God to show each of us a new thing. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together for him, Christ of the Upward Way, number 344.
the sanctuary on the table there. God's Spirit is always at work among us. God's Spirit is among us, making all things new, giving us new vision, lighting our path. Let us participate in this new creation by offering our gifts to God's service. Freely we have received, let us also give freely. Let us join in our doxology. It is Jesus Christ who welcomes us to this table. Jesus welcomes all those who repent of their sins, all those who proclaim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior at this table, to come to this table. Friends, come to this table in repentance. Come to this table in humility. Come to Christ's table to be restored, renewed. Come with gladness to the table of our Lord. Please remain seated and let's sing together our communion hymn as printed in your bulletin. Come to the table. your image and breathed into us the breath of life. 
And when we turned away, our love failed. Your love remained steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God, songs of joy are offered to you. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes bearing your steadfast love. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him, declaring him your beloved Son. With your spirit upon him, he turned away the temptation of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth, O oh God, to the church, delivering us from slavery to sin and death, making with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. Believing in Christ's promise of eternal life, we live in him and we declare together, Christ has died, Christ is raised, and Christ will come again. Almighty God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that as we receive this bread and cup, we might be assured of Christ's promise in these signs, and that in the sharing of this meal, we declare our faith and trust in our triune God, to whom all glory be, now and forever. Together we pray, as Jesus has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Jesus gathered with his friends at table on that Passover night, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And later, after the meal, he took a cup, and wine, and he said, this cup is God's new relationship, made possible by my life and death. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembering me. Remembering Christ's love and sacrifice for us, we come to this table, and we proclaim the mystery of faith. We proclaim that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We proclaim through these acts, that we will continue to do this until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will our elders come forward, please?
Friends, take, eat, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God. Friends, take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Following Jesus' example, we have shared bread and fruit of the vine. In these gifts, God has promised to be with us, making us whole, making us one. In celebration of God's goodness, let us offer the prayer of thanksgiving as printed in your bulletin. O oh God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, claimed us in baptism, and mercifully redeemed us on the cross. In this zeal, we remember your love and grace, and pray that through your grace, we may yield ourselves, our wills, our words, a continual thank offering to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together and sing our closing hymn, which is number 275, God of Our Life.
and now receive the benediction. May the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen and amen.